You'll often hear games critics claim that graphics don't matter, which sounds weird at first considering that this is an audio-visual medium. That's why this list isn't about graphics, it's about aesthetics. See, you can be at the cutting edge of tech, pushing as many polygons as current machines and budgets will allow, but without fail, chances are you'll be outpaced in only a couple years' time, making all that hard work look terrible by comparison to everything else that's available. That is, unless you also choose to stylize your graphics, to give them a unique and defining art style. Ever wonder why a lot of retro games still look good even decades later? This is why. They understood that basic concept. Choosing the right art style for your game can not only ensure its relevance and approachability in the long term, but it can also enhance the mechanics in some cases. It can put the player in a certain mood, or shape their frame of mind to be ready for a certain kind of gameplay. It can also feed back to them more of the relevant information they need all at once, without seeming too out of place or breaking that ever-elusive immersion. It is, no pun intended, a fine art, and by explaining what I love about that art, maybe I can help you all understand why this aspect of game design is so important. So hey, I'm What the Fnu, and this is Team Pizza's Top 8 Video Game Art Styles. Number 8 I know I literally just made fun of Crytek for thinking polygons were all that mattered, but if you'd believe it, at one point in this industry, that was actually true. When CDs became the main format for game storage, all bets were off. Nobody even wanted to touch 2D graphics anymore if they could avoid them, even if they were still just getting their bearings on how this new dimension worked. I get it. A lot of games from this era look terrible, and maybe this is more relevant to guys like me who grew up with this stuff, but personally, I think the low-poly look has a weird charm to it. There's just something about the general blockiness of it all. Something about seeing these basic 3D models propped up on a beautifully pre-rendered background. And I think a lot of that has to do with how art works in the first place. Think back to 8-bit games. A lot of people love that style because the tools being used to portray them are so basic that you can fill in the blanks however you like. It's more open to interpretation, which is part of what makes art Art, well, an art. What does the Guardian legend look like by modern standards? The hell if I know, but I can sure imagine. Early polygonal games have a bit of that going for them, with the added benefit of not looking quite real enough to be taken seriously. Don't get me wrong, I love me some Gran Turismo 2, but I also don't bat an eye when the enemies in Spyro stretch, morph, and bend in ways that should not be physically possible. It's a very video game-y look, which means you can do whatever you like with it and it still won't look weird. Terrifying at times, sure, but not too weird. I'd love to see a modern developer try to tackle this style on purpose, to use it to enhance their game and appeal to that era of nostalgia. Because if guys like me and Kadikaris are any indication, chances are there's a pretty good market out there for that. Number 7 a key skill you have to learn as an artist is how to communicate an idea to your audience, to say without words everything they need to know about what inspired you to create this particular piece. You'd think that would entail using as much visual information as possible, but in some cases it's actually better to focus down a few key points and emphasize them as much as possible. Minimalism is the process of saying a lot with relatively little. It's about nailing down where the player's focus and attention should be at all times, and doing everything in your power to not distract them from that. Here's the crazy thing though, even games that have totally different aesthetics can actually benefit from applying these concepts to their design. How many games have you played with an immersive HUD, that tried to display things like your health bar or ammo count in ways other than the traditional overlay? How many games keep drawing your attention to your overarching goal, that keeps subtly reminding you of why you're here and what you're doing? This is the power of minimalism, it gives you the self-control necessary to reflect Define your design and really nail down what's actually important. It may not sound fun at first, taking away all these cool things you wanted to put in, but trust me when I say there's a lot more power in communicating your game's rules as clearly as possible. Here's you, here's your goal, here's everything stopping you from getting to that goal. Go get him, Tiger. 
number six. Speaking of refinement, I think that's something else we're hardwired as humans to appreciate. Gold ore is valuable, sure, we know that, but it always looks a lot more appealing when it's been smelted into something pretty, like a ring. Making something by hand can be both challenging and edifying at the same time, which is probably why I like games based around craftwork so much. The creativity involved with something as abstract as making a lake out of paper or a dragon out of yarn is something I can't help but appreciate. Craftwork lets you take familiar imagery and recreate it in a way that most people just aren't used to seeing it in, and that is the cornerstone of a good aesthetic. It's also part of why this particular aesthetic works so well. Not a lot of people have used it yet, and it's not hard to see why. Trying to take polygons and using them to simulate a much more basic material like clay or cardboard takes a ton of skill. Never mind making it look as natural as some of these games do. But that's part of why I'm excited to be in the era we're in. These days, it's just not financially feasible to try and push the boundaries of photorealism any farther than we have. So to stand out, you have to take the already impressive power at your disposal and use it to make something unique. Adversity does breed creativity, after all. And if this is what we have now, I can't wait to see what devs create in the future. Number five. If you've not had the pleasure already, allow me to introduce you to anime. Hailing from the land of green tea Kit Kats, this art style is based around accentuating and emphasizing emotion. Anime characters are bright and expressive. They have huge eyes and elastic faces that can go from 0 to 60 in a matter of milliseconds. This is why a lot of the most popular anime is loud, over-the-top, and action-packed. The style makes it really easy to do that well. Many anime also touch on themes of growth and progression, of a relatable character that starts with nothing and eventually ends up better off than when they started. In some cases, being able to literally save the world. Hmm, oh, where have I heard that before? Video games and anime are like chocolate and peanut butter. Done right, they can complement each other in some truly delicious ways. They can make fighting seem more epic. They can make worlds seem more lively and colorful. And because anime humans are more caricatures of real people rather than a direct translation, they land in just the right spot of the uncanny valley. We can laugh when they punch someone into the stratosphere without those troublesome thoughts of what reality is capable of getting in the way. And because they're designed in such a way to elicit a cute response from most people, we can also easily emphasize with them when things get a little more serious. With all that said, is it any wonder why practically every JRPG made these days uses this style? Maybe not. Number 4! I'm willing to bet a good number of people watching this grew up with cartoons in some form or another. Animation is the field you classically pursue because you want the freedom to do whatever you want. If you want to make characters that can be anything, do anything, and won't ask for hazard pay in the process, then this is the field for you. And that's exactly why traditional cartooning has been a part of video games since almost the very beginning. For as long as some of us can remember, we've been exposed to characters like Mario, Pac-Man, and so on. These are surreal and deformed figures that nonetheless drag us in with their charm and bombastic personalities. Even today, games like Plants vs. Zombies and Citizens of Earth help bring a little color into our lives. They're not afraid to be entertaining at the cost of making absolutely no sense, and there's beauty in that. If nothing else, from a purely intellectual standpoint, most people can appreciate something coming along and shaking up the norm. It's exciting and interesting simply because it's different, it's refreshing, and it's almost always welcome in a medium that embraces escapism to begin with. Cartoons and the individuals that make them are awesome, and I'm glad to see people continue to see what they're capable of in video games today. Number three. You hear a lot of people throw around the term cell shading these days to describe just about any 3D game that somehow managed to have color in it, but what is it actually? 
Well, in layman's terms, cell shading is the process of making 3D models look flat. Instead of emphasizing every little bit of depth, every curve, point, and dip that's there, you instead make it look more toony by using far fewer shades, gradients, and tints than you normally would. The result looks like a cartoon come to life, like the characters leaped off the page Animaniac style and started running amok. And if I haven't sold you on that description alone, don't worry, I have a whole nother paragraph left here. Cell shading is basically the modern method of hitting that same appeal of early polygonal games without skimping on the production value. It's how you make a very detailed, very painstakingly rendered 3D model more expressive and colorful. It's how you go from Metal Gear to Mario, from Modern Warfare to Garden Warfare. And for anybody looking to marry the depth and complexity a 3D game offers with the same expressiveness 2D is famous for, cell shading has been a very effective compromise. At the end of the day, I really couldn't imagine games like Borderlands and Jet Set Radio being rendered photorealistically, which is why I'm glad this style has caught on the way it has. Number two. Remember what I said about appreciating things that were made by hand? I'm a firm believer that comparing video games to non-interactive art forms like movies or books is a pretty silly cause, but in some very specific, very rare cases, some of the old methods can still be the best. Painting something by hand takes a great deal of skill and time just to make it look halfway decent. So knowing that, a company making an entire world filled with high quality hand painted art is something that I will always appreciate. Paint is just gorgeous, especially in motion. The unique way the colors blend together makes this style immediately recognizable in a crowd, and it's that eye-catching nature that makes this one of the most desirable art styles out there while still being one of the hardest to pull off. And the best part? Because of its already storied history, this is a very well-researched field. There's plenty of reference material to work off from artists that have explored what paint can do when applied to just about every theme and mood imaginable. So if you do have the talent to make this kind of art happen, I guarantee your next bit of inspiration is just around the corner. If I had to make a list of the most beautiful games I've ever played, I guarantee you at least half of them would be hand-painted. And the way things are going, I don't think that's ever going to stop being true. It's number one! Now isn't this fitting? My personal favorite art style in any video game is the one that video games themselves were directly responsible for popularizing. Don't misunderstand me. Any pundit with Microsoft Paint can sit down and draw out something that vaguely resembles a human one square at a time. But good pixel art, and I mean really good pixel art, like you see in Shovel Knight or Freedom Planet, is something that not just anybody can deliver. Talk about making a lot out of a little. In this style, every bit counts. Every single block, where you decide to put it, and the exact hue it is, can drastically change the quality of the finished sprite. Not only that, but most modern audiences are used to much higher quality images than these. When you've got companies like Arc System Works lovingly drawing out their characters in HD, you'll quickly find that making something look good despite purposefully limiting yourself like this becomes a Herculean task. And yet, game after game, year after year, generation after generation, we've seen some truly talented devs prove to us that good design is timeless. That no matter how advanced our tech gets or how refined our tastes become, the core principles that let Super Mario Bros. reignite an industry over three decades ago can still benefit the games of today. This is what a video game looks like. And it's an image I'm more than proud to love. Sorry to say, guys, but that's the end of the list. But it doesn't have to be the end of the time we spend together. Now I've got a ton of other countdowns on this channel, such as my top eight birds in video games. Huh, awfully convenient that just happened to be sitting there. Click this annotation here to watch that, or the little eye in the corner to see the entire playlist. 
I also have a rant series that goes for a more laid-back and thought-provoking style, if that's your thing, so maybe give that a look as well when you've got the time. Stalk me on Facebook and TweetR, because frankly you could do with a few more mad ramblings in your life. And as always, please consider subscribing so you can catch more videos like this as soon as they go live. Until then, I'm What the Fnew. Later, everybody!